Hello and welcome to daily chapter reading, chapter 7 of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies by Jane Austen and Seth Graham Smith, the New York Times bestseller. Mr. Bennett's prosperity, property consisted almost entirely in an estate of 2000 a year, which unfortunately for his daughters was entailed in default of Hare's mail on a distant relation and unfortunately for all was surrounded on all sides by high ground making it troublesome to defend their mother's fortune though ample for her situation in life could but ill supply the deficiency of his her father had been an attorney in Meryton and had left her four thousand pounds she had a sister married to a Mr. Phillips, who had been a clerk to their father and succeeded him in the business, and a brother settled in London, where he had earned his letters in science and where he now owned a pair of factories dedicated to the war effort. The village of Longbourn was the only one mile from Meryton, a most convenient distance for the young ladies who were usually tempted thither three or four times a week despite the unmentionables which frequently beset travelers along the road to pay their duty to their aunt and to a milliner's shop just over the way the two youngest of the family catherine and lydia were particularly frequent in these attentions their minds were more vacant than their sisters and when nothing better offered a walk to meryton was necessary to amuse their morning hours and occasionally practice their skills at present indeed they were very well supplied both with news and happiness by the recent arrival of a militia regiment in the neighborhood it was to remain the whole winter resting coffins from the hardened earth and setting fire to them meryton was to be the headquarters their visits to Mr. Phillips were now productive and the most interesting intelligence. Every day added something to their knowledge of the officers' names and connections and fresh new, new, news from the battlefields of Derbyshire, Cornwall, and Essex, where the fighting was at its fiercest. They could talk of nothing but officers, and Mr. Bingley's large fortune, the mention of which gave animation to their mother, was worthless in their eyes when opposed to the regimentals of an insane and the excited manner in which he spoke of beheading the stricken with a single touch of his sword after listening one morning to their effusions on this subject mr bennett coolly observed from all that i can collect by your manner of talking you must be two of the silliest girls in the country i have suspected it some time but i am now convinced I am astonished, my dear, said Mrs. Bennet, that you should be so ready to think your own children silly. If my children are silly, said Mrs. Bennet, that you should be so ready to think your own children are silly, sensible of it. Yes, but as it happens, they are all of them very clever. You forget how quickly they become proficient in those oriental tricks you insisted on bestowing them. Being practiced enough to kill a few of the sorry stricken does not make them sensible, particularly when their skills are most often applied for the amusement of handsome officers. Mama, cried Lydia, my aunt says that Colonel Forster and Captain Carter do not go so often to Miss Watson's as they did when they first came. She says them now very often burning the crypts in Shepherd's Hill Cemetery. Mrs. Bennet was prevented replying by the entrance of the footman with a note for Miss Bennet. It came from Neverfield, and the servant waited for an answer. Well, Jane, who is it from? What is it about? It is from Miss Bingley, said Jane, and then read it aloud. My dear friend, if you are not so compassionate as to dine today with Louisa and me, we shall be in danger of hating each other for the rest of our lives, for a whole day's tete-a-tete -tete between two women can never end without a quarrel. Come as soon as you can on receipt of this, provided the road is free of the unmentionable menace. My brother and the gentleman are to dine with the officers. Yours ever, Carolyn Bingley. Dining out, said Mrs. Bennet, that is very unlikely, given the roads, the troubles on the road to Neverfield. Can I have the carriage, said Jane? 
No, my dear, you had better go on horseback, because it seems likely to rain, and they spring so easily from the wet earth. I should prefer you have speed at your disposal. Besides, if it rains, you must stay all night. That would be a good scheme, said Elizabeth, if you were sure they would not offer to send her home. I had much rather go in the coach, said Jane, clearly troubled by the thoughts of riding alone. But, my dear, your father cannot spare the horses, I am sure. They are wanted on the farm, Mr. Bennet, are they not? They are wanted in the farm much oftener than I can get them, and too many slaughtered upon the road already. Jane was therefore obliged to go on horseback, and her mother attended to her to the door with many cheerful prognostics of a bad day. Her hopes were answered. Jane had not been gone long before it rained hard, and the soft ground gave way to scores of the disagreeable creatures, still clad in their tattered finery, but possessing none of the good breeding that had served them so well in life. Her sisters were uneasy for her, but her mother was delighted. The rain continued the whole evening without intermission. Jane certainly could not come back. This was a lucky idea of mine indeed, said Mrs. Bennet, more than once, as if the credit of making it rain were all her own. Till the next morning, however, she was not aware of all the felicity of her contrivance. Breakfast was scarcely over when a servant from Neverfield brought the following note for Elizabeth. My dearest Lizzie, I find myself very unwell this morning, which, I suppose, is to be imputed to my being set upon by several freshly unearthed unmentionables during my ride to Neverfield. My kind friends will not hear of my returning till I am better. They insist also on my seeing Mr. Jones, therefore do not be alarmed if you should hear of his having been to me, and accepting a few bruises and a minor stab wound, there is not much the matter with me. Yours, etc. Well, my dear, said Mr. Bennet, when Elizabeth had read the note aloud, if your daughter should die, or worse, succumb to the strange plague, it would be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley and under your orders. Oh, I am not afraid of her dying. People do not die of cuts and bruises. She will be taken good care of. Elizabeth, feeling really anxious, was determined to go to her, though the carriage was not to be had, and as she has, she was no horsewoman, walking with her was only alternative. She declared her resolution. "'How can you be so silly?' cried her mother, "'as to think of such a thing with so many of them about, and in all this dirt. "'You will not be fit to be seen when you get there, assuming you make it alive.' You forget that I am student of Bailey of Shaolin, mother. Besides, for every unmentionable one meets upon the road, one meets three soldiers. I shall be back by dinner. We will, we will go far as Meryton with you, said Catherine and Lydia. Elizabeth accepted their company, and they set off together, armed only with their ankle daggers. Muskets and katana swords were a more effective means of protecting oneself but they were considered unladylike and having no saddle in which to conceal them the three sisters yielded to modesty if we make haste said lydia as they walked cautiously along perhaps we may see something of captain carter before he goes in meryton they parted the two youngest repaired to the lodgings of one of the officer's wives and elizabeth continued her walk alone crossing field after field at a quick pace jumping over stiles and springing over puddles during this impatient activity a bootlace came undone not wanting to appear unkempt upon her arrival at neverfield she knelt down to tie it there was suddenly a terrible shriek not unlike that which hogs make while being butchered Elizabeth knew at once what it was, and reached for her ankle, ankle dagger most expeditiously. She turned, blade at the ready, and was met with the regrettable vis vi visage of three unmentionables, their arms outstretched and mouths agape. The closest seemed freshly dead, his burial suit not yet discolored, and his eyes not yet dust. He lumbered toward Elizabeth at an impressive pace, and when he was but an arm's length from her, she plunged the dagger into his chest and pulled it skyward. The blade continued upward, 
cutting through his neck and face until it burst through the very top of his skull. He fell to the ground and was still. The second unmentionable was a lady and much longer dead than her companion. She rushed at Elizabeth, her clawed fingers swaying clumsily about. Elizabeth lifted her skirt, disregarding modesty, and delivered a swift kick to the creature's head, which exploded in a cloud of brittle skin and bone. She too fell and was no more. The third was unusually tall, and though long dead, still possessed a great deal of strength and quickness. Elizabeth had not yet recovered from her kick when the creature seized her arm and forced the dagger from it. She pulled free before he could get his teeth on her and took the crane position, which she thought appropriate for an opponent of such height. The creature advanced, and Elizabeth landed a devastating chop across its thighs. The limbs broke off, and the unmentionable fell to the ground, helpless. She retrieved her dagger and beheaded the last of her opponents, lifting its head by the hair and letting her battle cry be known for a mile in every direction. <laughs> Elizabeth found herself at last within view of this house, with weary ankles, dirty stockings, and a face glowing with the warmth of exercise. She was shown into the breakfast parlor, where all but Jane were assembled, and where her appearance created a great deal of surprise. That she should have walked three miles with so many unmentionables about in such a dirty weather and by herself was almost incredible to Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and Elizabeth was convinced that they held her in contempt for it. She was received, however, very politely by them, and in their brother's manners there was something better than politeness. There was a good humor and kindness. Mr. Darcy said very little, and Mr. Hurst nothing at all. The former was divided between admiration of her brilliancy, which exercise had given to her complexion, and doubt as to the occasions justifying her to take the great risk of coming alone, with nothing but a dagger between her and death. The latter was thinking only of his breakfast. Her inquiries after her sister were not very favor favorably answered. Miss Bennet had slept ill, and though up, was very feverish and not well enough to leave her room. Elizabeth attended her, silently worrying that her beloved sister had caught the strange plague. When breakfast was over, they rejoined with the sisters, and Elizabeth began to like them herself, when she saw how much affection and solicitude they showed for Jane. The apothecary came, and having examined his patient, said, much the, to the relief of all, that she had caught not the strange plague, but a violent cold, no doubt from doing battle in the rain. When the clock struck three, Elizabeth felt that she must go. Miss Bingley offered her the carriage. When Jane testified such concern in parting with her, Miss Bingley was obliged to convert the offer to an invitation to remain at Neverfield for the present. Elizabeth most thankfully consented, and a servant was dispatched to Longbourn to acquaint the family with her stay and bring back a supply of clothes at Elizabeth's request, her favorite musket. <laughs>